welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guests, Dr. Evan Alexander and Karen Newell. And they're here today to share with us their new book, Living in a Mindful Universe, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. Now, many of you know Dr. Evan. He is the author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Proof of Heaven and Map of Heaven. Dr. Evan Alexander was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at the Burham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Now, Karen is a lifelong seeker of esoteric wisdom and has amassed a wealth of firsthand experiences exploring the realms of consciousness. She is the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics, an innovator in the emerging field of brainwave entertainment audio recordings used to help listeners reach transcendental states of awareness. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell to the show. Well, thanks for having us, Marianne. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, what a joy it is to have both of you here, and of course, to talk about your new book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Oh, we, we're very excited about it because it, uh, it's a very ambitious effort to bring uh, really modern science and spirituality together in one uh, one package, and I think that's what's uh, catches people's attention when they when they encounter this book. Well, and what's really interesting, I think people have been asking for a book like this for a very long time. They want to see that bridge between science and spirituality. Well, I think that's very much the case. I mean, our world seems to be in a fair amount of trouble, I would say. It's not necessarily following a smooth pathway. There's a lot of conflict and kind of misunderstanding and uh, fake news and all of that, and what we're trying to do is kind of return people to a to a center and to a discernment and to a way of kind of uh, using their intuition and going within and all of this to making better sense of their lives, and uh, that's really what uh, living in a mindful universe is all about. But what makes it so unique is, you know, there is a lot of spiritual information in there, but what's special about it is the scientific framework underlying it all, and that's what Eben really brings to the table is not just things that we have to take on faith, but there actually is some science behind it, and a lot of conventional science like to ignore some of these things, but the more open-minded ones are really seeing that science can bring a lot of those spiritual concepts uh, to, to some real kind of solid foundation behind them. Well, and before we get too ahead, because I've got a bunch of questions for the both of you, because this book I felt was really profound, and it takes, it really does take some great attention. Um, how did it come that the two of you are working together on such a, you know, just a fabulous project? Well, um, I would say uh, in many ways it kind of started with, uh, with my near-death experience back in 2008, uh, which was uh, chronicled in the book Proof of Heaven, but that that book is really kind of a question mark. It says, well, okay, well, these extraordinary experiences reported by millions uh, have a, a, a you know, they seem to refer to a common realm, and there's something about the deeper nature of spirit that we need to acknowledge, as opposed to just dismissing it as hallucination. Uh, but really, in many ways, when I look back on the journey. Uh, it's even more empowered by Karen's experience. And, you know, I met her three years after my coma and came to realize that she had been living her whole life uh, in, in from a philosophical position that I was just beginning to discover was the best way out for modern science, quantum physics, consciousness studies, and all that. And it's it's really that position of idealism where mind is fundamental in the universe and when I first met Karen, I realized that, shock of all shock, she'd been living her whole life uh, from that idealist position and doing it very, uh, very well and having great insight into kind of the workings of this world. So in many ways, uh, I think it's just uh, an evolution of her journey, uh, kind of combined and catalyzed by my uh, journey chronicled in Proof of Heaven. But this is really all about 
uh, a bigger awakening because you cannot just follow a scientific pathway or just follow a spiritual pathway to get to these deep truths. You really need uh, all of it. It's a, it's a bridge between science and spirituality, and that's what we're trying to put together in this book. Yeah, and when I first met Evan and asked him, you know, what happened during your near-death experience, I was expecting a big kind of spiritual explanation or lesson that he learned. But instead, he looked at me and he says, the brain doesn't create consciousness. And I was confused and said, why would anyone think that it does? And so you can see we were coming from completely different opposite ends of the spectrum, yet we found so much common ground. And eventually, we decided that it belonged in a book so that people could really see that that they're not two completely polarized things, that they really can come together. Well, I'm so glad that you both um, brought that up because a lot of times when you meet people who are extremely spiritual, they're not grounded. And it's really difficult for people who come from the science community or who are lateral thinkers can even connect with what they're saying. And so it's so nice to be able to have a book that bridges both of that. Well, and one of the things that, you know, you, what you're saying that spiritual people are not always grounded, that, that is true. They, they get very wrapped up, and I went to many, many, many spiritual conference, interacted with these people. I myself be, probably became ungrounded here and there. But what, what's really important in the spiritual realm is discernment. It's not that everything you come across is, is the God's honest truth. You really have to develop a sense of discernment. And scientists, of course, have drawn the line in, in a particular place in the sand, uh, many of them. And I say we can go across the sand a little bit, but not necessarily all the way and believe everything we hear in the spiritual kind of community. But there's plenty of it that rings true, that can be found to really kind of be universal truths that all of us can uh, count on. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems in our modern uh, culture is uh, kind of the reign of super specialization. Uh, and we all look to the experts and especially look to the scientific experts uh, to get some uh, answers about what might be true. Uh, but the problem is consciousness is so gigantic. I mean, it's really the only thing any human being has ever known. Uh, and some materialist scientists simply dismiss consciousness as an epiphenomenon of the, of the workings of the uh, atoms and molecules and the substance of the brain. And that is a major error, and, and that's where our mainstream science has gone wrong, is to so completely miss what consciousness is, and that this is all really about the relationship between brain and mind. Uh, and that's something we go into in great detail in living in a mindful universe. Uh, and and it's all, we're only just emerging to a point where there are scientists around this world who really study consciousness. And given that uh, when you realize that consciousness is not created by the brain, that's where you realize that neuroscientists who, who subscribe to the uh, underlying assumption of the scientific revolution, that is that the physical world is all that exists, why they fall prey uh, and, and really lose sight of what's really going on here, which is consciousness and phenomenal experience itself. And that is what we need to honor and study. And studying the brain is not going to get us there because, as we point out, in Living in a Mindful Universe, not only does consciousness not reside in the brain, it's not created by the physical brain, but neither is, is memory. Uh, memory itself, uh, neuroscientists have been looking for it somewhere in the brain for more than a century, and the evidence very strongly from the neurosurgical community is that uh, memory is not resident in the physical brain either, just like consciousness is not. Uh, the brain serves as a reducing valve or filter that allows us access to memory and to consciousness itself. Uh, but they're not the creators of it. And that's where our modern science has gone so wrong, and that's, in fact, where the deep mystery of quantum physics lies, because quantum physics is right there at the intersection of what we know and the physical world and how the two interrelate. And so our book really covers a lot of that tremendous territory of expansion and understanding that's part of a revolution in science that I think is unprecedented in our history. Well, and is that what you mean when you talk about in your book, um, Dr. Evan, is that consciousness is fundamental to the universe? It's, it's this whole idea that, you know, science is still trying to figure out what's going on with consciousness in our memories. 
Well, that's exactly right. And and what we're finding is you, the the old idea of conventional science that physical matter is all that exists and that the brain must somehow thus be producing consciousness simply out of physical matter and that there's no other causality involved is completely wrong. Uh, one thing people need to realize is a consequence of that vision of conventional science at the brain creates consciousness is that none of us have free will at all, not even remotely, because they see consciousness as the epiphenomenon of the atoms, molecules, and cells of the brain following natural laws of physics, chemistry, biology. Um, and that is not what's going on. There's far more evidence for things like non-local consciousness, uh, telepathy, precognition, past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation, all of the near-death and shared-death experiences and after-death communications. There's a tremendous body of evidence that has been studied by scientists that show very clearly that that consciousness can be non-local, that it's not stuck in the here and now of the physical brain. Um, and that is tremendously liberating when you realize how that empowers each and every human being to tap into that consciousness, that primordial mind that is the creative force of the universe, what near-death experiencers might describe as a God consciousness or the uh, consciousness of spirit, of source. Um, and what we're trying to do is simply elaborate that connection. And so the book not only hints at the tremendous revolution going on in scientific circles, but also much more importantly for the individual reader, it offers tools and ideas about how to explore consciousness, how to go within through uh, using differential sound frequency for uh, uh, brain entrainment uh, to liberate us from the illusion of the here and now and the illusion that consciousness is created by the physical brain itself. So the book is very ambitious in what it brings uh, not only to the world at large in terms of these changes in worldview, but also to the individual in taking control of their own life and in truly manifesting the free will of their higher soul. I couldn't think of a more timely um, you know, it, point in our history to have a book like Living in a Mindful Universe, Dr. Evan and Karen. I mean, I, I think it's perfect timing because people are really wanting this. They want to have that connection between what's going on with them as far as in a spiritual um, aspect and making sense of it in today's world. And so it brings me to my next question. With, with, you kind of hinted on this a little bit, but is there scientific evidence that God exists? And I think a lot of people are, are kind of on their edge of the seat, kind of waiting to hear about that. Well, uh, there's a quote that I often put out uh, in presentations, and I think it's very apropos to your question. And it's from Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1932 for his fundamental work in uh, uh, notions of quantum physics and what quantum physics really means uh, in terms of what it's telling us about the nature of reality. And Heisenberg said, the first sip from the glass of natural sciences will lead you towards atheism, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. And what he was really meaning there is something that should be obvious to anyone who studies and understands quantum physics. Um, and that is that uh, looking for all the rules of causality within our physical world, looking at all these uh, subatomic particles, atoms, and molecules, and all their interactions, we come up short. You cannot explain all the workings uh, of, of this world, especially revealed through quantum physics and its assessment of the very makeup of the fabric of the material world all around us, uh, without realizing that... Um, there's, there's something more, as, as William James pointed out, a great psychologist in the uh, early 20th century, there is what he called the more, that you needed more to explain uh, the workings of the world, and quantum physicists have come to prove that. The thing is, they try and answer it. For example, if you qu query uh, quantum physicists, uh, poll them about their favorite interpretation of what's known as the measurement paradox in quantum physics, which is the very unusual feature of contextuality and the fact that uh, the mind of the observing scientist has a, plays a crucial role in the outcome of any experiment. You cannot, uh, you know, come up with a result of the experiment simply based on the physical world alone. It depends on that observing mind and the questions it's asking. And 
Uh, what this is really telling us, uh, what th- those physicists would say, many of them, uh, the most popular interpretation of quantum physics is uh, Hugh Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation, where infinite parallel universes unfold at every instant in space-time whenever a subatomic measurement is made. And so for them, that solves the math and the physics of quantum physics, and they walk away from it very happy, saying that infinite parallel universes answers the question. Whereas, in fact, I would say the question is best answered by realizing that consciousness creates all of emergent reality. And this is the view that is coming uh, to a head in quantum physics, because the experiments have more and more refined uh, the affirmation of entanglement, or what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And as we explain in Living in a Mindful Universe, that's why the primordial nature of consciousness, how there is really the one mind and we all participate in that one mind, that is what explains this. And it is absolutely something that uh, one could interpret as a God consciousness, as a co-creative force that uh, participates with our minds in emergent reality. And that's why things like prayer have so much power. That's why things like synchronicity, that is the apparent coincidences in life, when we look from a, a broader perspective, we realize they are giving us hints about the fundamental nature of mind as controlling all the working elements of the emergent reality of our universe. So we really cannot get away from that sense of mind or consciousness, that God force, at being at, uh, as the source of it all. Well, and to kind of piggyback on that, what are your thoughts of the scientific evidence for reincarnation? Well, actually, that evidence is very strong. If you look, uh, for example, uh, at the works of Ian Stevenson, who was the head of psychiatry at the University of Virginia in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, and the Division of Perceptual Studies that he founded at UVA. Uh, and in fact, that group, uh, currently headed up by Dr. Jim Tucker, now have analyzed more than 2,700 cases of past life memories in children where the best uh, explanation is actually of reincarnation. Now, of course, you have to guard carefully against fraud and deception, which these scientists have done extensively. Um, And in fact, I think the thing that gets many people's attention is when they realize that something like 35% of those 2,700 cases have uh, uh, concerned children who have birthmarks on their bodies that correspond with the lethal injury of a prior lifetime. And that is really stunning when you realize there's that kind of physical evidence and connection that links them to the story that they're trying to tell of having memories from a past life. Now, it would be one thing if you had one or two or three such stories, but these investigators over decades, scientists, have found more than 2,700 such cases. We really need to just acknowledge that reincarnation is absolutely real. And then any other kind of models of brain, mind, consciousness, and the workings of, of human realities need to incorporate that kind of very broad understanding of the absolute reality of reincarnation itself. Yeah, when we look at consciousness as this, um, you know, this energy that's coming in constantly, it makes sense that there would be reincarnation cases that happen, especially when you talk about you know, children having these memories or these different things that happen, and then over the course of time, you know, it's it's kind of proven that these are things that they've not been exposed to. Right. Well, I think it's very important to also point out, so you start with this tremendous scientific base of studies of past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation that gives you this broad picture of, yes, reincarnation is real, But from that, I would also argue, then look into the world of transpersonal psychology. Uh, That is a world that has evolved, especially in the last two or three decades, a lot of it based in the work of of, of brilliant investigators like Dr. Stan Groff, uh, Dr. Michael Newton, and Dr. Brian Weiss. Uh, And these uh, very kind of, these people were all trained in a kind of a conventional uh, physicalist worldview, just as I was, but they came to realize in working with their patients that you could not explain all the challenges and trials and tribulations of this lifetime without realizing that 
tremendous uh, swathes of it are governed by events that have occurred in other lifetimes that these same souls have been through. So what it's pointing out is that our soul journeys are vast indeed. You cannot explain them within one lifetime. Um, and in fact, a lot of the healing uh, and becoming more whole that comes from the world of transpersonal psychology is very much dependent on the fact that we kind of set the stage for the events in this life through our actions and behaviors and thoughts in previous lifetimes. And that's where I think we really start getting a far bigger view. Now, uh, of course, proving the reality, the factual reality of, of what someone might glean in a past life regression uh, can be very challenging. But if you read the works of some of these uh, great uh, investigators, you find that there is plenty of evidence there. But from my point of view, it's not so much proving the reality of those events uh, through, you know, the Internet or historical records, but it's more in realizing that to best live our lives in the here and now, we need to simply acknowledge that we've been through a lot in previous lives, too, that add to our current circumstances. And if we can open ourselves more fully to understanding all those relationships, we can become more whole and grow into the souls that we came to this world to be in the first place. Well, I think that's very empowering for a lot of people once they hear that, how that can come full circle for them as a, as a soul. And it um, kind of leads me to my next question, because we talk about quantum physics and understanding our unfolding reality. What's the role of the observer in all of this? Well, the observer is, that is the, the, the biggie, because the observer is what actually exists. And, uh, yeah, so Evan talks a lot about that observer in quantum mechanics. And what I like to kind of connect the dots for people is that that observer is us. Each and every one of us behind our thoughts, emotions, and kind of daily ramblings that go on in our minds is an observer. And this observer is highly important. This observer allows us to kind of take a step back and see in a bigger picture from an objective point of view why certain events might be going on in our lives. And meditation is one way to get in touch with that observer. Now, the Eastern forms of meditation, especially Buddhism and stuff, are very uh, kind of mind-centered. They want you to kind of empty the mind, release all thoughts, uh, release all emotions, everything, just, just kind of rise above it all and, and let go of all of the concerns of the day, and I find that that is very helpful to gain a neutral perspective, to kind of be able to set aside that, those racing, rambling thoughts in order to get behind the real kind of personality of who you are is this neutral observer with plans and hopes and dreams of what you're going to accomplish in this lifetime. But I also like to point out that the heart and emotions is a very important part of this. Now, many people will say we want to kind of ignore our emotions, rise above them. And what I say is we kind of want to dive into our emotions, figure out why we're having them, where they're coming from. I found my particular emotions served as kind of clues to what my life lessons were, ways that I could get beyond certain frustrations. The emotions really offer a wonderful clue, but... The emotions can be overwhelming if you're just diving into the emotions, and that's why developing this kind of internal objective observer can be so useful because then when you dive into your emotions, you have this kind of bigger picture view. And this is this is one of the ways we kind of dance between, uh, you know, our rational mind and our, our passions, our feelings, and the, the kind of modern world, Really, as we all kind of grew up, you know, crying wasn't necessarily valued and, and being emotional and losing control of yourself, being all histrionic, wasn't necessarily useful. And, in fact, those kind of emotions, when you can view them from that objective point, really become engines. They become opportunities to grow. And so in our book, we talk about balancing kind of that mental state and emotional state in a very, very kind of productive, useful way for the end user, which is really us. Every person on the planet has a unique perspective on why they're here, and each of us is contributing to that whole. And so that unique value 
is, is highly critical for each of us to kind of get to know and understand inside of ourselves. Along, along these lines, I would just point out, you know, as an academic neurosurgeon, more than 15 years teaching at Harvard Medical School, I thought I understood how brain, mind, and consciousness work before my coma. Um, and, of course, that involved the linguistic brain, the, vo- the, the voice of rational, logical thinking, which also just so happens to be the voice of our consciousness in our head. Uh, well, remember what uh, Michael Singer says about that voice in the head. Uh, he calls it the annoying roommate. And I think that's very important. As much as it's aligned with our, our ego and our sense of self, it is an annoying roommate. And as you come to realize that the physical brain is not the creator of consciousness, but is simply a reducing valve or a filter that allows primordial consciousness, that God consciousness, in to our perception, then you realize why going within can be so powerful. And, and learning that that little voice, all those thoughts racing in our head and of course, the ego uses mainly fear and anxiety as its tools. Every bit of that is, a, is in many ways kind of a sham. And so what I think Karen and I talk about here is rising above that. That's what that neutral observer is all about. My first words when I came out of coma were, all is well. And what I've come to realize is that by uh, using that all is well as kind of a litmus test, I can rise above the petty little concerns of my ego and start developing my relationship with that inner observer, that objective self, which is not really part of self at all, but part of the, of the great one mind that uh, uh, we're all sharing. So it's, it's really a, a shift of perspective, perspective that I believe is very empowering. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Dr. Eben Alexander and Kara Newell in regards to their new book, Living in a Mindful Universe a neurosurgeon's journey into the heart of consciousness. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guests, Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell, and they're sharing with us their new book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Now, before we went to break, we were talking about meditation. 
my meditation practice has allowed me to get beyond you know and 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 look at things in a more rational kind of objective way and it's interesting Karen when you talk about diving into the emotions you know there is kind of a sense when people do a meditation practice for a period of time it, it seems like there's a level of frustration because it it's like maybe their practice kind of stalls out or they're not getting to a new plateau but when you talk about diving into your emotions it's really dealing with the here and now and i think a lot of people will enjoy using this as part of their practice yeah and the heart really is so useful and we've forgotten about how useful it is you know um, HeartMath Institute in California has been doing research for decades on the heart, and what they found is that there's this torus field, this electromagnetic field that emits from all of our hearts. Now, really, any kind of electric system does emit the same torus field. The brain has one, too, but the heart is massively larger than the brain's. It actually extends out from the body um, at least three feet, and every time they seem, seem to build a device to measure it, we seem to eventually reach the maximum of that uh, device's ability to measure. So one might argue that that heart field is unlimited in its, in its power to reach around the world. Now, the, the most interesting thing to me is that that torus field actually affects the people around you. They've done experiments where someone will sit across the table from someone else, and the one person who is involved in the study uh, knows how to do a particular technique they call coherence. And coherence really is just, at its most basic, just feeling a sense of gratitude in your heart, feeling a sense of gratitude, not thinking about a sense of gratitude in your mind. That's very simple, but feeling that sense of gratitude. So when people who have practiced that technique sit across the table from someone who's not practicing that technique, their heart rate vari variability and their brain waves start to synchronize with the person sitting across from them. And so this, to me, is the absolute most powerful thing that can empower each and every one of us, knowing that what emotions we're holding in our heart is affecting the people around us. I kind of liken this to the ultimate golden rule. By placing only beneficial kind of processing all of our hurt and angst and kind of pr traumas from the past and replacing that with only loving, gratitude, caring kinds of feelings. We're actually loving our neighbors as we love ourselves in the most profound way I can possibly imagine. That golden rule is often talking about, you know, how do we love our neighbors? How do we love our neighbors? And that's so hard when they're so much not like us. But when we can love ourselves, not just with our minds and appreciate who we are, but actually become the love, that is at the center of each and every one of our consciousness, that is how we can really demonstrate that golden rule. And uh, I feel it, it's really each and every one of our responsibilities to take that into our consciousness. We can't manage the hearts of anyone else in the world except our own. And so the more of us who do this, the more of us who take it upon themselves to clear their emotional traumas, to to manage their energy very consciously with loving, caring thoughts and feelings. This is how our world can really change. And that's ultimately the message of living in a mindful universe, is that love is the binding force that connects us all. And by consciously focusing on that, not just in our, you know, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one romantic relationships, but every relationship, parent-child, boss-employee, mailman, you know, mail receiver, just every single relationship, doctors, nurses, CEOs, everyone, politicians, if they could only just find that love from within, focus on that every morning before starting that day, I truly believe our world would become a different place. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. I think a lot of times people have difficulty finding that self-love. So to focus on that, man, what a game changer that would be. Yeah, and not just with our minds. It's about becoming that love. And many of us have forgotten how to do this. You know, we grow up, when we're first born, we're just little balls of love. I know this because I just had a grandchild. My, my daughter, you know, of course I remember what it was like loving her as an infant. And, of course, they grow up and they start to have issues and difficulties and challenges. But 
those little babies have that love. And, and her her son, my grandson, is just a huge reminder of how we all come into this world holding that love. And so the more of us who can maintain it, who can re kind of bring it into our lives from that pure kind of childlike trust that all is well, knowing we'll be taken care of. It's challenging to do that, in, especially in today's world with all the polarization that's going on. But no matter which pole you're at, it doesn't matter. Everyone along the spectrum has a heart, has a heart that's performing this function every day, and we're just kind of unconscious of it. But becoming more conscious of it, no matter what your belief system, is something we all can do. And it helps not only ourselves, it helps everyone on the planet. Well, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And um, I'm going to toggle over to Dr. Eben. And, you know, and I'd love to get your perspective as a physician on how you see the future of healing moving forward. Well, that is an excellent question because I would say, uh, just as in, in one sense, all that we're ever talking about in this discussion is the nature of consciousness uh, at a very deep level, we're also just talking about becoming more whole, becoming more of who we came here to be. Um, I love uh, in, in, in trying to address the question of the, of the purpose of life. I love referring to the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, inscription over the entrance to the temple, temple of the Oracle at Delphi, which is know thyself. And essentially that's what all of us come into this world to do is to know thyself. But the interesting thing is this evolving model uh, of the relationship between brain and mind uh, based on quantum physics and on modern consciousness studies is very clear on the fact that we are all in essence sharing one mind. There's a a tremendous amount of overlap in our conscious awareness, our shared consensus reality, uh, but in many ways we are sharing, uh, kind of living the dream of the one mind, and we're all participants in this. Um, and so this is about uh, really learning more about the universe, because in essence each and every one of us uh, has an identity with the universe at large, and becoming more whole is, uh, in essence, trying to define that uh, in a much richer form. Uh, and that certainly involves, as I could see when I came back from uh, my, my coma journey and my near-death experience and reported in Proof of Heaven, but it certainly involves an acknowledgement that love is the binding force of all. That's essentially what near-death experiencers have been telling us by the millions, uh, you know, over thousands of years, independent of any prior religious uh, belief systems or what have you, people touch that love, that incredible sense. And uh, that's something I tried to convey in Proof of Heaven was the extraordinary uh, nature of that uh, infinitely healing form of unconditional love, basically the love of the creator for the creation. And so each and every one of us is in a process in our life of trying to understand more and more about who we are in this universe, which really means defining that much broader relationship of the one mind and how it is generating all of emergent reality. So it's really all about healing. I came to see that the challenges and difficulties in life, and that certainly as a doctor would include injuries and illness, that these are gifts. These are these stepping stones that allow our souls to grow. Uh, if all we did was win the lottery and sit around drink, drinking champagne on the yacht all day long, we'd get nowhere. That is not a gift. The gift is in how we are able to uh, kind of discover ourselves and enrich and learn who we are as souls by facing the challenges. Uh, and that includes the tough stuff like uh, a terminal diagnosis, uh, the suicide of a child, uh, something like that. I mean, really the big bad stuff. That's what we deal with in all of our workshops and conferences are these uh, tremendous losses that people uh, have in life. And what we try and point out is how those extreme challenges offer up a beautiful pathway of discovery by the by recovering the notion of love and connectedness with our loved ones, with the universe, by coming to realize that we don't just exist birth to death and nothing more in one incarnation, but we have a far vaster experience of multiple incarnations of growth 
and that always the guiding force is one of love, of first and foremost recovering love for self, because that's the greatest travesty of our modern civilization, is we've really lost that sense of love for self as divine connected beings with great responsibility for our emerging uh, reality. But it's our free will that must manifest that. And the more that we can manifest uh, unconditional love for self and others, neighbors and, quote, enemies, uh, that's how we bring healing into our lives. The more we recover that sense of having been here before, that we're with our soul group and that we come back again and again, all in an effort to grow and learn and ascend towards oneness with that divine force of love at the core of it all, then we realize that by manifesting love, compassion, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, and acceptance acceptance to self and to others, that's how we really grow and become more whole. And becoming more whole is healing. Healing comes from the same root. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and this is a, a journey of discovery that we're all on. But uh, some of the impediments of our current world, our culture, uh, with all the fake news and kind of polarization uh, uh, of people against each other, is very misleading. And that's why going within, uh, discovering many of these truths within ourselves, uh, and how they link us with the entire universe and with our ability to shape that universe, that, I think, is what, what is the biggest gift of this awakening that we're talking about in living in a mindful universe. Well, and um, Dr. Eben, do you find that having been in that experience with that, you know, that complete love where it's unconditional and then coming back and having to explain it sometimes can feel like a, a, a difficult task because of it feels like it's um, an experience that one has to go through in order to really feel the totality of it. Well, I think the the best news, and this is a point that we make very strongly in Living in a Mindful Universe, is you don't have to be smote down by meningitis that almost kills you to get this. As a conscious, sentient being, everyone listening to your podcast has the power to go within and to discover these truths for themselves. Now, people often have kind of experience envy, and they want to have that big NDE where they're almost They almost die, but then come back to this world. But what I'm saying is I know from my experience with many people in our workshops, many people who are fans of Karen's um, differential frequency brain entrainment work with sacred acoustics, uh, that many people who have not had an NDE can come to the very same knowledge and truth and know the reality of the eternity of their souls and that love is the fundamental force in this universe. And they can discover that by developing a regular practice of going within. That's uh, one of the biggest gifts of living in a mindful universe is helping to give people the tools to do exactly that. And how encouraging that is because getting struck by lightning isn't all that. You know, I've had a friend that was hit by lightning. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the near-death experience that uh, a lot of people re, you know, want to have. Well, that's true, but of course, in Living in a Mindful Universe, we have an extended story of a good friend of ours who was struck by lightning and, in fact, had an extraordinary life-changing experience based on that uh, near-death encounter. Yeah, but he had to go through so much pain to get there, and it took years for him to integrate it all. And so, yes, it (laughs) it really isn't necessary to, to go through such pain to feel these things. I have touched that unconditional love. I have been awash in what I felt was this warm, you know, again, words don't explain it. You do have to experience it for yourself to fully understand, and we all can experience it. When we're giving our workshops, I ran into all kinds of people who have also felt that amazing, you know, force of love without having a near-death experience. And once you feel it, you you have that reference point. You can conjure it up again. And it often comes to people when they're in a, a big traumatic moment. Um, in my case, it wasn't a big traumatic moment, but I actually cultivated the connection. It involves some trauma, though, just remembering past emotions, letting go. We need to let ourselves feel emotional if, if we stand a chance of feeling that amazing, unconditional love. And usually it's that gift of desperation when someone is just so emotionally distraught or when you're 
conjuring up that love from within, you can actually attract it to you. So there are many ways to do this. We're all unique. We all can kind of experiment through trial and error and find what works best for us. There's no one size fits all in this kind of tradition. It, it really, you know, scientists like to find the magic bullet that will work the same on most, if not all, people. And it just doesn't work that way. We're all so unique, come from different uh, backgrounds, different vibrational states, I would say. And so it, it takes different impetus to to really kind of trigger these kinds of experiences. Um, but I think it can be done. I think all of us can feel that love. And kind of one of my goals is not just to go out into a meditative space and expand and feel the love, but to actually bring that love here, bring that into our daily lives. And in fact, Sacred Acoustics just released a, uh, a new recording that's called Love Body, and it actually guides people to do exactly that, to generate love from within, and then we have different sounds that kind of support the process, and then invite that love into the body. And people are having amazing experiences, um, some more quickly than others, some need more practice than others at really generating that feeling of gratitude, but it can be done, and it is one of our goals to really bring that love into our world here and now, not just go out and visit it and say you can't have that till you die, but to bring it here and to live with love in our lives. Well, and I felt that living in a mindful universe really gives people a roadmap to be able to discover that love for themselves. And, and you guys have just done a beautiful job on this book. One of the topics that comes up is spiritual health. And maybe, Karen, maybe you can expand on this a little bit because you have talked about how we can develop that in our lives and given us some resources outside of um, living in a mindful universe. What are your thoughts on that? Well, spiritual health is kind of the center of all health. When it really comes down to it, you know, our doctors are, are so interested in your your physical body symptoms. But when you explore the world of energy healing, what their belief system is, is that actually everything starts energetically and then affects the physical body. So if you can kind of dive into the energy of your problem, and that is your emotions. It really is the, the kinds of thoughts and feelings you bring to a situation is what I mean by the energy. And so... You know, we tell some stories in the book that are actually in my family. My daughter had her own struggles with um, uh, substance abuse and anger and depression as she was growing up. And really what did it for her, what really began her turnaround is when she asked me to take her to a hypnotherapist. She was tired of the talk therapy. I wouldn't let her have any prescription medications that the doctors wanted to give her because she was busy abusing those same prescriptions and I didn't want to give her her own. And one day she asked me if I would take her to a hypnotherapist because she had learned that there she didn't have to talk about her problems necessarily. She didn't have to go review with the doctors all of the things, crazy thoughts she was having. So in this hypnotherapy, she was able to kind of go back to the source of uh, what began all of this. It's, it's, hypnotherapists will guide you through this process of what's called regression, to take you back to the source of a particular problem when you're in a calm, kind of expanded meditative state. And, and as she did this, she guided my daughter through, through uh, it was a very many-step process, but the root of it was she guided her to two different future scenarios, one in which she made no changes in her life, and, and my daughter was able to see what her life would be like at one year, five years, ten years in the future in her mind. And then the hypnotherapist said, okay, let's say you do make some positive changes in your life. What then is your future going to be like? And then she regressed up to her future. And then the hypnotherapist asked her to make a choice. Which life would you like? And she, of course, chose the, the better life, the one where she did make changes in her life right now. And then she guided her to realize that her inner guidance was actually a future version of herself. And when Jamie realized that her guide was her future, wiser self, this empowered her to no end. When she realized that her power came from within by the choices that she made, by the choices she made about who her friends were, what her emotions were going to be, how she reacted to situations, it empowered her unbelievably. And we didn't notice a change 
immediately from one day to the next. But often when you look back over time and you realize, oh, my God, that was a huge turning point. When she started to realize her power came from within, that's a spiritual connection. When, you know, when we talk about spiritual health, we're not talking about going to church or having a particular religion, although people can find it that way. What we're talking about is acknowledging that unseen part of yourself, the vibrational part of yourself. That's your spiritual self. That is so important for us to come to get to know, to understand, to learn how to work with. And that is what we really are encouraging people to do. It, it can, kind of can be likened to this masculine-feminine balance where our world has really been very masculine. And by that I mean we can just say external. Masculine is very external energy. We're all focused on what's going on around us in the external world when we think about our problems. But when we can flip to looking internally at what's going on, that's a more feminine approach. And when we find that balance of external and internal, then we start to find that divine union of masculine feminine. And for me, this has been a very useful model to encourage myself to go within. Many of us don't want to take time to do that. We have so many other things going on in our lives. But when we find that balance, when we make that commitment, you really find out for yourself the power that it has. We can talk about it till the cows come home and tell you how wonderful it is. But until you start to practice, do it yourself, that's when you'll really find out. And that firsthand experience, again, is a huge focus of living in a mindful universe, not just us telling you things, not just us, you know, expecting you to believe what we're saying, but to go find out for yourself, to find your own truth, to see what works best in your life. But don't ignore that internal world. That spiritual world really does contribute to the physical health of the body. So how does this relate, excuse me, to prayer and meditation? Well, I think prayer and meditation are just uh, the ways that that humans can most readily uh, kind of access that primordial mind, that universal mind. Um, For me, whenever I talk about uh, using differential sound frequency brain entrainment for deep meditative states, I'm really talking about a form of centering prayer. Centering prayer uh, is kind of a silent form of prayer that acknowledges gratitude, connection, oneness, uh, a trust in the universe. Um, And for me, it's all really part of one process so that as soon as I go into a meditation using sacred acoustics, uh, I, I often will have a goal, I'll state an intention, and Karen has instructed me tremendously in how to uh, kind of simplify those requests or intentions at the beginning of a meditation, even down to one word. But she very much emphasizes the power of the emotional content, not just the conceptual flow. As we keep saying over and over again, you don't think your way to these answers. Uh, in essence, you're kind of following the power of that emotional engagement uh, and, and addressing the, the, those emotions and, and what they are. But the, the interesting thing is you're also doing it by uh, obtaining a, a perspective, that higher perspective of that neutral observer of the one mind, the connection with the higher soul. So really this kind of meditation or centering prayer is uh, always a form of developing a richer uh, relationship of the sense of self, um, that that observer within, that uh, awareness, with that creative force of the universe. And, and that's where I think it gets to be so powerful. But uh, people have demonstrated that through prayer uh, for ages. Um, you, you find elements of it, say, in the 12-step program that's been so successful for Alcoholics Anonymous and for drug, drug addicts uh, in addicted settings um, is really, in a sense, turning it over. But what, what we're acknowledging there in those 12-step uh, programs is that our ego is not the boss. And I think that's the problem is so many people are so kind of wrapped up, they, they begin to lose sight of the magic of that awareness, and they start thinking that their ego and their linguistic brain and that kind of voice in the head that is so full of fear and anxiety, that that is really running the show. But it is not. It's little. That's little more than a parlor trick. So we're talking about using meditation and centering prayer or a 12-step kind of approach, what, what, however you want to label it, but using that to access that higher self 
where you can truly manifest a free will uh, and a power of trust in this universe that is very much your ally. And that would come into tremendous help for so many in this world today who are circling the drain in this uh, rising uh, spiral of suicide and of depression uh, across all age groups. I mean, our culture is really quite sick at this point in time, as manifested through this rising suicide depression rate. And, and what Karen and I argue in Living in a Mindful Universe is that that is uh, uh, absolutely a consequence of, of not coming to see this relationship of oneness with the universe and that we are one with that creative force and with that power. Uh, and it's not our petty little ego that plays any role. We learn to put the ego into time out, but see this as uh, the higher good for all involved. And that is absolutely a place where you can quickly come to realize through prayer or meditation that all is well. And then start manifesting uh, your highest dreams to become the reality of this world. Well, I think that is a um, a beautiful note. And we're... I think I have time for just one more question here before we go today because, I mean, what a um, just enlightening discussion this has been, especially in regards to your book, Living in a Mindful Universe, and everything that it covers. When we talk about unconditional love and the epidemic that we're kind of seeing now of people that are committing suicide or feeling extremely depressed, what are some of your final thoughts around all that? Well, I think it has to do with uh, kind of the deep message of our book and what I hope people have gleaned from this uh, this podcast, uh, and that is a sense that we can we can trust in the universe, and that we do have this connection with a force that has tremendous love and care for us, uh, and can help us to uh, achieve this this goal of oneness of coming into being who we came here to be. Uh, but it is absolutely turning down the volume of that insanity coming out of our ego uh, and all the demands that that ego makes. Um, and, you know, suicide is never the right answer, especially when you realize that reincarnation is real, because we'll only come back uh, to face the same issues again if we don't resolve them in our life review. And I think what we really want to do is, is bring back meaning and purpose to our lives. Uh, you know, the rise of the science and, oh, the rational and we can't believe in superstitious things. And I think we've come a, a little too far on that direction and taken away meaning and purpose. Some conventional scientists will say we're just automatons walking around following the natural laws of the, you know, hormones and, and neurons and things in our bodies. And, and that's not very empowering. That kind of takes away all meaning and purpose to why we're even here. And I think that really contributes to that rise in depression and, and anxiety about, about our lives. And when we can restore meaning and purpose, we, when we can guide people to really find why are they feeling depressed, what is that trigger, what really needs to be fixed, how can we find love from within, all of these things I think will start to help heal this world when we start to make some headway. Now, Sacred Acoustics, just to mention, is actually just completing a pilot study with a psychiatrist in New York City. She's been giving our uh, different recordings to, and actually very specific recordings to some of her patients and measuring their anxiety over time. And she's finding that those who incorporate Sacred Acoustics into their life, those that listen to it on a daily basis, are seeing their levels of anxiety reduce much more quickly than those who are just doing regular therapy. So we're hopeful that science will start to help validate some of these different tools to help them get into the hands of more people. Um, it really, the crisis is undeniable. You just, every day, suicides and addiction and overdose, and we really do need to start tackling this from an internal level and not just handing out medication and expecting that chemical imbalances will solve it all. And I would also encourage your listeners to uh, visit ebonalexander.com and partake in a completely free uh, 33-day email course that introduces them to uh, some of the main topics we cover in Living in a Mindful Universe uh, and also gives them uh, at each one of those days 
gives them suggestions for a practice and things that they can do in their own meditations and in living that day uh, to learn and grow with all of these tremendous world-changing concepts. So I would encourage people to uh, get on board with that 33-day course uh, into the heart of consciousness, which is there at the uh, lead page of evanalexander.com. And it includes uh, some of the sa- sound files that we're talking about. That It includes some of those recordings with, at no cost. And the beautiful thing is people from around the world have been taking this since our book launched in September. It's self-paced, so people can keep doing it whenever they wish. But they're leaving comments, and you can really see all the different walks of life they are coming to find this information useful in their lives, and they're having interesting discussions and helping each other, and we pipe in now and then, and it's just beautiful to see the world coming together like this. Well, and so, Karen, where can people connect with you? We've um, got Dr. Evans' um, website. What website would you want people to go to to learn more about you and your work? Well, sacredacoustics.com is our website where all our recordings are available, and it also includes some free things. There is a free 20-minute download you can access just by entering your email. There are some free training videos that are posted on YouTube, all linked to from sacredacoustics.com, that teach people how to use this. And you don't even have to buy anything. You can apply the uh, tips and techniques in those videos just using the free 20-minute download and or the recordings that come with the uh, 33-day journey. So we invite everyone to check it out and find what works best for you. We have a wide variety of options for all the different kinds of uh, personalities and approaches people might want to try. Well, and before we go, I also know that both of you have a retreat that's coming up with 1440.org. We do. That's in uh, in the end of September, I believe, and we have another weekend retreat in upstate New York at Omega Institute. And then we're at various conferences in Utah, Seattle, Santa Fe, uh, London. You can go to either of our websites, evanalexander.com and sacredacoustics.com, to see what might be coming your way, Um, and that's the best way to stay in touch with us. Well, I signed up for the 33-day journey. I highly suggest everyone do the same. Dr. Evan and Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, Marianne, thanks so much for having us. It's been great being here, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yes, and thank you so much for what you do, which is bring different minds together to share with your listeners. And it's it's very much appreciated by us that you are doing that for people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen and Dr. Eben. My goodness, it's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Living in a Mindful Universe. If you'd like to purchase a book, again, you can at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all major retailers. And of course, don't forget our indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.